this first session of the Green Post Corona Talks, organized by the Green European Foundation. I'm Dirk Holmans, your host, co-president of the foundation and director of Oikos, the Flemish Green Think Tank. As we all know, the corona crisis is in the first place a health crisis, which has to be tackled in the best way. That's priority number one. But at the same time, the corona crisis is also changing our societies and has resulted in a huge economic crisis. But we shouldn't give up hope. On the contrary, the aims of these post corona talks is twofold. First, to achieve a better understanding of what is happening also in different parts of Europe. Second, to explore how we can imagine and realize a better world after Corona. That's really, I think, the perspective we have. And before we go to our first speaker, I want to say that you can submit questions um, with uh, the hashtag of the Green European Foundation, the post Corona talks, and then uh, I will see the questions on my screen and later I will pose them to Hans. So now I want to welcome Hans Brunings, Executive Director of the European Environmental Agency. Many thanks for, I think, in very busy times to uh, have time for this uh, live interview. And as a start, I would like to refer to your editorial, what you wrote in your last newsletter of the agency, which has appropriate title, Reflecting on Climate Neutrality Ambitions in Europe in Times of COVID-19. There you, of course, also say that uh, taking care of Europeans' health is now the first and foremost priority. I think we all agree on that. Next, you point to the effect of the COVID-19 measures on the greenhouse gas emissions in Europe, which are going down. Uh, but you also mentioned the evidence that uh, long-term exposure to air pollution can contribute to chronic lung and heart diseases, which could mean that people with such existing preconditions could even be more vulnerable during this period. And uh, so, yeah, do we already have any reports on this? Is there material comparing certain regions of Europe? Uh, because of course uh, it can be an extra argument to reduce uh, air pollution. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on, on this first uh, session of a series. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be with of you and thanks also for the question the opening question i think it's a, it's a very important question and we've known for uh, some time it's established knowledge that uh, living in bad air quality indeed has an impact of course on our uh, on our respiratory system but also on heart uh, conditions eh, cardiovascular but also on the immune system uh, through impacts on the brain and so that is long established knowledge. And it's evident that if we see uh, a crisis like the Corona crisis, that people start to look for patterns in causality. Uh, and indeed there are at the moment several studies that are uh, hinting rather strongly at this. And one study is done by the University of Cambridge, which has uh, come to the conclusion that the London area, but also the Midlands and some of the industrial areas in uh, the UK, where you have poor air quality, that there are more people dying or suffering grave consequences. There is another study from the University of Siena and the University of Aarhus in Denmark that has looked at Northern Italy and that comes with similar uh, results um, or correlations at least. And then we've got a, a Harvard study which looked at 3,000 counties in the US and is also linking air quality to uh, the corona crisis now. Um, they come to the conclusion that uh, there is at least very strong indication that living in poor air quality is a contributing factor to understanding the impact of uh, COVID-19 on people's health and on uh, the long, on, on the impact of COVID-19. And that means uh, the serious consequences and people dying also. Now it is a equally clear that we will have to wait for larger scale studies that uh, are more of an, a broad scale epidemiological nature to understand the full impact and to weigh it off against other factors. But, uh, the indications are rather clear for the moment. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, that's all. Yeah, I think uh, important knowledge, and let's hope that further studies uh, can give us further uh, information and correlations. Uh, in your editorial, you also, of course, mentioned that the current crisis has a strong effect on the production and consumption patterns. For instance, people taking less their car. There are no planes you can take, which. Uh, of course, reduces the emissions of greenhouse gases, but there's no certainty this will be a long term effect. So Europe has to achieve its goal of climate neutrality in another way, really building a resilient economy. And then there the question is, uh, in this crisis, which is, of course, horrible, are there new opportunities for this? Well, of course, we will have to support the most affected people. Well, yeah, first of all, I think it's, it's rather clear and it, it, we also wrote it in our newsletter. Uh, I mean, this type of societal cost of the current crisis can, of course, not be the way to reach long term sustainability objectives on climate or environment. That is that is obvious. This is not the way to do it. Huh? At the same time, I think uh, it is leading to reflections on what are the systemic origins of this type of crisis. What is it telling us about our consumption and production? How can we reflect on ways uh, forward that uh, that go into uh, yeah more fundamental questions about our energy system? If you look at uh, the prices on energy markets now, I mean, if you're talking about the need for disruptive solutions in the future. It's not this type of disruption that we want, but at the same time, it makes us reflect. I've read half a dozen articles at least about the price of oil and what signals it is sending about moving in a post-carbon uh, framework. Um, the same can be said for other things. Um, another thing which I, I find uh, very encouraging is that there is quite a bit written also uh, in the political discourse about the crisis, about indeed the distributional aspects of it. Which groups is it hitting more than others? Not only in the medical impact, but also job-wise, which are the fragile uh, people on the, the labor market? And how can we take them into account when we are uh, providing stimulus packages? So I'm encouraged by the, by the fact that uh, when people talk about the future, that they keep uh, an eye on these long term sustainability trajectories, but also on the social uh, dimension that is part of, uh, I would say, any uh, public investments in the economy and also on, on how governments can steer distributional issues in a future oriented economy that is not only low carbon and circular and takes care of uh, our natural capital, but that, that also uh, leads to a fair uh, society in the future. Okay, I think that's really crucial. And the um, agency uh, published uh, the end of last year, it seems now already a long time ago, a quite important report, State and Outlook of Europe's Environment 2020. And I must say, although of course you, we are all aware of it, it was still uh, quite a wake up call uh, because uh, the report really stated that we need a change of direction, not only in the face of uh, the climate change challenges, but also the degradation of nature and the overconsumption of natural resources. Also, the report shows that the European Union has already achieved significant results, for instance, in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. but. It also shows very clearly that we are not on course for our goals for 2030 or 2050. So what is the most urgent needed to be able to achieve these goals? I, I think the, the report comes to four conclusions when, when it comes to how we can imagine uh, reaching those 2030 objectives and then looking beyond 2030 towards 2050. Huh? And one, one conclusion is that uh, we need to implement better what we promise. I, there are serious implementation gaps in many policies in Europe, including in climate policies, even though overall Europe has made significant progress by reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 20% since 1990. And so better implementation. 
That is, of course, a key responsibility of, uh, of national authorities and then the sectors that, that are part of that. The second conclusion, I think, is, uh, is very fundamental. It, it states very clearly that um, even if we would implement better, right, this is not going to be enough to make these necessary fundamental changes towards sustainability. In other words, we have to come up with more integrated systemic transitional type policies if we want to reach our 2030 objectives, whether they are framed in a global sustainable development goals perspective or now in the European Green Deal perspective. Yeah. The, third, the third conclusion, if I may, is, is, is that there is a risk that we make the wrong investments, yeah, that we think that by perfecting, making current technologies a bit more efficient or making current business models function better, that we will reach the 2030 and beyond objectives. And uh, I think we need, we need to move away from this logic of making increasingly costly marginal efficiency gains in systems that we know, because it's costly and it's a dead end street. Marginal efficiency by its very definition as engineers and, uh, and economists will tell you, has a limit. Huh? And we need, we need to start going from a high cost dead end street logic to an investing in breakthrough technologies that will lead us not only to 2030, but open pathways to 2050. And then the last uh, conclusion was that this is clearly not something for governments only. You cannot do this from uh, Paris and Berlin and Brussels and Rome. You will have to do this with society. This is a societal transition. So the engagement with, uh, with societal actors will be absolutely critical. And if you then look at that, yes, we're, we're on the way to framing ambitious 2030 and 2050 objectives. They're politically embedded in the European Green Deal, but it will take quite a bit of innovation and not only technological innovation, also business models and social innovation uh, to reach them, and I think keeping the focus on these systemic longer term objectives and making the necessary changes in policy in our financial systems, but also in our governance from local level to, to the European level will be absolutely critical. Okay, thank you for these uh, clear four points. Uh, I would add to this that if you want really system change, we also have to stop uh, doing the wrong things. And you mentioned already the extremely low price of uh, oil, but at the same time, we are still subsidizing fossil fuels. Isn't it now really the time to stop this policy and use the money for urgent climate goals? Yeah, I, yes, I will answer this question immediately, Dirk, but let me pick up this thing of stop doing things. And, and I think uh, subsidizing the wrong things is one of the things we need to stop. But okay. the whole idea of uh, going through this sustainability transition, of course, the, the term speeding up and scaling up good solutions and the good practices is, is key language. In order to uh, facilitate this speeding up and scaling up and to create a space for that, uh, we will indeed have to stop doing things. Uh, and uh, the more we are willing to do that, the, the greater we create or the more we create the space for the good solutions. And when we then go into the energy field, uh, as you mentioned, it's part of a broader discussion that has been with us for two decades, uh, the, the environmentally harmful subsidies debate where the OECD, I think, played a critical role, but also a lot of economists uh, have written about, uh, you know, cost internalization and how subsidies go against that fundamental principle. And it's also mentioned numerous times in EU documents and studies, including the European Environment Agency. So, yes, uh, we, we really need to speed up moving out of subsidizing the unsustainable. Um, because we pay twice, we subsidize something now and we have to fix what is unsustainable uh, later. So uh, it, it's also from that perspective, highly irrational. Um, and that is of course true in, in the field of, um, of energy, but you could also say that is true in the field of mobility. It, it works in some economic sectors. So we, we, need, we need to use the money that we now use to subsidize move that in the direction of 
supporting those who are on a, a different trajectory that is sustainable. So I don't think the message in our reporting uh, or in our studies is that take the economy, take the money out of the economy. That is not the European model in a mixed economy. Yeah. The message is come with a credible and rather fast trajectory that moves that money in a fundamentally sustainable direction. And that is where the sustainable finance initiative, I think, can play a critical role. Okay, and so you talked about the risk of uh, choosing for goals 2030 and then create a kind of lock-in. So I think this also refers to uh, gas, which is sometimes uh, uh, proposed as a kind of uh, midway solution, but it can also be a kind of lock-in. Yes, and we actually did a report um, uh, two and a half years ago, if I remember well, uh, on uh, lock-ins in energy investments. And we did a very detailed analysis at the company level, even energy companies, where we look in, into uh, lock-ins, financial lock-ins and stranded assets, the potential for stranded assets uh, in coal-fired power plants, but also in gas uh, uh, plants and eh? generating electricity. And uh, our estimate is that uh, about 20% those investments uh, could be stranded assets by 2030, not only in coal, but also in gas. So I think gas as a short-term transitional and variable uh, factor in the energy system, yes, it will be with us, but it will be a matter to uh, use the, the current potential as good as possible and to reflect very carefully on uh, not making the wrong investments that will indeed lock us in to an energy trajectory that is by now no longer compatible with Europe's uh, uh, key climate and energy priority for 2050, and that is becoming the first climate neutral uh, continent. So uh, one has to reflect very carefully on one where one uses the billions that are required to be invested in the energy system for the future. And we talked about the money you need for uh, investing in the new things. So I guess we also at the European and but also of course then at the national level, we really have to change our fiscal uh, policies and system. Because we are taxing, we are taxing labor and all, almost there are almost no taxes on let's say the use of the environment. Uh, indeed, and, and here again, we are talking about the debate that, that is really old. Eh? Environmental tax reform has been in the, in the policy language for at least 20 years, I would say. Uh, there are oodles of studies and reports analyzing not only what is happening, but also how it can be done and implemented, also in a socially just manner and how we can move from taxing societal goods, like people having an income from a job, to societal bads, and how we can use that to drive uh, this shift to a, to a more sustainable economy. Um, this is, by and large, not showing up in a, in a significant increase in uh, green taxes in Europe. Uh, it is still around uh, five and a half, six percent the tax base, you know, two and a half, three percent of uh, the GDP. Um, and most of those taxes on top of that are not on pollution, uh, they are on fuels. Yeah. And uh, so the, the, the full potential of uh, environmental tax reform, I think, can, needs to be used. By the way, it is an advice that is coming from the OECD and the European Commission to countries for quite some time. It seems to be very difficult to integrate that in national tax uh, systems, but I think it is a critical component indeed of uh, moving uh, the, the, the production and consumption habits in a certain direction, whilst at the same time reflecting very carefully how in a society where the tax base is changing because of people getting older, uh, the, the demographic, but also in changing of industries from production industries to more service industries, to more fluid industries that, that are spread out on the planet, like the digital economy, 
on how we can provide for a tax base that, that provides stability for all the functions of the government, including uh, stimulating a more sustainable society. Okay. Well, you already talked about really the need for a system change. Uh, also, the subtitle of the report we are discussing is uh, Knowledge for Transition to a Sustainable Europe. Um, is this concept of transition, do you see this reflected in the new Green Deal the European Commission has put on the table? It's really well, systemic changes. Yeah, literally, yes. I would say in, in the, the term transition is a key term that is used in the European Green Deal. It says literally that Europe needs to lead the transition towards a more sustainable society. Huh? So it is, it is a term that has meaning and I think that the agency's work has contributed to giving it meaning at the European level in a, in a policy context. But it's also, in my opinion, deeply embedded in the ambitions. If you look at uh, carbon neutrality, 2050, if you look at the circular economy, uh, if you look at a world leading biodiversity strategy, the ambition of a zero pollution uh, Europe, um, a biodiversity uh, strategy that, that, that really underpins society, I think just stating those ambitions implies that we will go to systemic transitions. We cannot do it with the current systems of production and consumption. So it is mentioned in the language with a particular meaning, but it is also for me deeply embedded in the ambitions that are framed under the European Green Deal. We will not get there with incremental marginal policy improvements or with uh, you know meddling in the margins. It, we will have to reconsider the fundamental system components if we want to reach those ambitions. Okay, that's very clear. And of course, uh, and we already saw it from reactions from countries like uh, Poland, who are still dependent on coal. One crucial dimension of this uh, Green New Deal is uh, the just transition. Yeah. How can we make sure that all regions in Europe can win by this transition and we don't make divides already existing uh, larger. So I think, uh, I don't know whether it's also in your report, but this focus on just transition seems really crucial to me. Yes, and I, I think uh, the, the term just transition, if you go through the origins of uh, environmental justice, it, it is it is linked also to pollution and its impact on various you know social uh, groups in society uh, linked to income distribution and so th there is a long history there but under the current understanding in the green deal it is in, in indeed linked to uh, to this understanding that for some regions and some parts of Europe making this transition might have disproportional impacts on on uh, jobs and on on income of people. And if economists say that they don't want stranded assets, I think as a society, we need to be equally uh, firm and say, we also don't want stranded regions and we also don't want stranded workers. Yeah? So I think that the key way of doing that is by including this from the start in the policy trajectories, the systemic trajectories that we are envisioning. Uh, th this sort of, uh, impact on workers and on regions should not be the next externality. Yeah? At the moment that we fundamentally start internalizing climate and environmental issues and material consumption into our models for the future, we should make sure that we, we then do not end up with the next externality. And that is, oh, we made this green transition, but now we have a, we have a social situation that is unacceptable. The, the whole idea of systemic and integrated uh, policies is, of course, to take that from the start as one of the key dimensions uh, to bring to the table. And yes, that requires investments as well. And I think that's where uh, the, the, the Justice Fund uh, is, is uh, looking to contribute uh, in, in this debate. Okay, another very ambitious element uh of the Green New Deal is the farm to fork strategy, uh, sustainable food production, uh, good income for farmers. Uh, 
strategy which is connected with climate and biodiversity. It is highly ambitious and uh, I can imagine that some groups in Europe are not really fond about it. So how do you see what are the chances we also here see this needed system transition? I think, in all honesty, I think this will this is a hard nut to crack huh, for different reasons. I mean, food is uh, is highly personal. It's cultural. Uh, it is uh, the biggest part of the European territory in terms of land use. There is an incredibly long history of how this system has developed. It's deeply embedded in the identity. Uh, so it, it is a it is a really uh, big challenge, yeah. But I think if we start from uh, from two points, I think we we can uh, we get some grip on it. And the first part is that I think it's terribly unhelpful. Uh, what is often done is to limit the debate to farmers and to agriculture. Agriculture is only one stage in a whole food chain discussion yeah and the farmer is often already part of a big input that comes before him and that's the agro uh, chemical uh, industries then you've got the, those who buy agricultural products and transform them into food because most of the time in the supermarket we don't buy directly agricultural produce we buy food yeah and then there is the distributors, and in some countries that's only a handful. And then you've got the consumption part of it. Huh? And so I think if we would focus on, on the whole chain, the food chain, and look where we can come in with governance approaches that drive sustainability along the chain, that would already uh, be a big advantage. And that, uh, that is partially what I think what the farm to fork wants to do. Uh, because it's terribly unhelpful to be a stigmatizing one link in that whole system. And that is, that is uh, often a rather weak link uh, in the system. And that brings me to a second point. I think at the moment we pay for our food at least four times. Yeah? We, we subsidize farmers, which if you think of it, the people who are producing the basis of our food, which is rather fundamental to our existence, they often don't make a decent living. We need to subsidize them. That is a really bizarre thing if you think of it. Yeah? Secondly, we pay for our food when we pay, when we buy it. Yeah? And thirdly, you could say we pay for our food when we are dealing with the environment and climate consequences of our current food system, and they are multiple and profound. And fourthly, we pay when we go to the doctor because Europe has a very safe food system by and large, arguably the safest on the planet. It's not necessarily the most healthy food habits that we have as consumers. Now, there must be a better way in the 21st century to deal with a food system than to pay four times for our food. Yeah? Uh, so I think we, we need to reflect in a systemic way how we can bring food in line, the food system, with climate objectives, with energy objectives, with objectives on our natural capital, biodiversity, but also with broader societal objectives of health and well-being. And uh, I think the, the farm to fork strategy can play a significant role in opening up that debate in Europe, because yeah, I think it's fair to say that the debate has been rather closed for a long time. And we have now, I think, one extra dimension which is also the expected impact of climate change on food production in Europe. Also, this, I think, something very crucial. Yeah, indeed. We did a recent uh, report where we look at the impacts on the food system. And if you look at the, the expected harvests uh, for a number of the, the, the really important uh, agricultural products, uh, the, the crops in Europe, it, it is going to be very, very significant with losses, especially around the Mediterranean basin uh, that are 20, 30, 50 percent, which also will have an impact on, on the very feasibility of agriculture in those regions where that is a really important part, not only of the economy, but also of cultural identity and of landscape, uh, uh, you know, features. 
uh, and also economically on the the price of agricultural land uh, we we uh, in our report mentioned very significant losses of agricultural uh, of the value of agricultural land and not the, the mediterranean basin of course will be will bear the, the biggest burden because of heat waves droughts water shortages uh, i mean those things but it goes well into uh, Europe. Huh? It, it goes well into France and into Central Europe and uh, into Belgium and even uh, the southern part of the Netherlands. And this is by uh, 2030 and 2050. So this is not, uh, this is not science fiction for uh, centuries to come. This is uh, impacts that, that we expect to be very significant in the next decade. So climate adaptation will be necessary in the agricultural and food system that will of course be only possible if we stick to very strong mitigation measures in this you know zero carbon or carbon neutral uh, europe uh, and even then the impacts will be uh, significant on the food system okay thanks and of course climate change uh, also will affect uh, the already difficult situation uh, in the field of biodiversity, biodiversity loss. Also there, the European Union has uh, a biodiversity, biodiversity strategy. Um, do you think that uh, the Corona crisis could slow down the Green New Deal or, the, or this biodiversity policy or because it's, it's a lot together, of course, yeah. with tackling the Corona crisis? Well, I, I think uh, there we we have to listen to what uh, the top policymakers are sending as signals, and I think the the, the most senior people in the Commission, uh, President uh, von der Leyen, but also uh, Executive First Vice President uh, Franz Timmermans, they have made it very clear that they are fully committed to the European Green Deal and to the digital economy as the key drivers of their strategy, but also as the key drivers to come out of this crisis. Yeah? Um, there has also been significant political support uh, coming from ministers of several member states, from uh, people in the European Parliament, uh, in, in support of that direction. Now, I, I think it is also clear, and it has been mentioned in debates in the European Parliament, but also by Commission officials, there might be some delay in the agenda. I mean, we, we should be realistic. This crisis is, for all the good reasons, uh, absorbing a lot of attention and political uh, capital to, to, to bring and hold Europe together around the solutions. Uh, and so there might be some delays also linked to the global agenda. I mean, the, the COP in uh, Glasgow has been postponed. The COP on uh, biodiversity that was planned in Kunming, China, has been postponed. So, yes, but I think there is full commitment to uh, all the key components of the European Green Deal, and that includes uh, the climate commitments, the biodiversity commitments, the resource efficiency and circular economy commitments, and I would say the, the health and environment commitments that are embedded in, in the European Green Deal. Okay, many thanks. Uh, meanwhile, uh listening to us have been uh, sending in questions. So I think it's good that we uh, also include them in our conversation. And we talked about the fiscal system. And one of the questions is uh, on taxing, taxing consumption. Is there a potential unintended consequence of creating dependence upon revenue from behaviors we want to eliminate? So, um, Yes, if, if you tax consumption, I mean, there are several uh, things that one has to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, there is distributional issues. Yeah? If you're very wealthy and you are a family of four, you need one bread a day. If you're rather poor, you need one bread a day. You tax the bread in the same way. It falls dis, uh, disproportionately on people that have a low income. And so distributional issues are an inherent part of uh, those who are studying of the studies of those who are working on environmental tax reform. Eh? The second part, of course, is are you not eroding the very tax base that you have just created? Because if you want to use environmental tax reform to uh, shift people away from those 
behaviors that you are taxing, yes, you are eroding the very tax base. So it is by definition a dynamic system of taxation that has to be linked to the broader uh, taxation. And the question which I, I did not fully understand was, are you not risking uh, to stimulate behavior that that you in the end don't want? Was that the gist of the question? The question was more, as you said, that if we uh, put if we put taxes on behavior we don't want, yeah, and then people stop doing this, and of course, as you say, you erode the fiscal basis. So I think this was the clear question. Yes, that is now. Of course, there are there are ways of. Uh, you could say tightening the screws you know, by 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 keeping the tax base and increasing uh, the efficiency requirements that you want from a behavior, and so you continue. But yeah, it, it is as I said, it is a it is a an essential uh, part of uh, working with environmental taxes that one has a very clear understanding of uh, how it is linked to behavior and shifts in behavior and thus to an erosion potentially of a tax base. That is that is absolutely the case. Okay, thanks. We move to the next question. It's about uh, who should take the lead in this transition. You talked about the multi-level governance. We have, of course, European Union. We have national governments. We have cities. And uh, yeah, who is now who should take the dynamic lead in this? Well, I, I think it is clear that in an EU setting that uh, quite a bit of the agenda over, and this has been the case over the last decades on environment, climate, circular economy has been set from the European level. Yeah? But it's equally clear that a lot of the implementation modalities and the responsibility for implementation and driving this agenda has come from the national level. But I, I think what, what is increasingly clear, and, and I think that, that makes me optimistic, is that at the urban level, there is a lot happening that uh, goes well beyond what countries are often putting on the table. If you think of the covenant of mayors, when it comes to climate uh, mitigation and adaptation, uh, they are clearly going beyond uh, what their national governments are, are uh, you know, putting on the table in many cases. Uh, there is also a, a really dynamic urban uh, system that, that is aimed at integrating sustainable urban solutions that is very functional in a number of cities. If you just look at the finalists of the European Green Capital Award, huh? uh, and of course you can look at that as an award and recognition, but you can also look a bit deeper into what that means. And you will notice that all of those cities have a very clear view, uh, they're linked to the energy system and what, it, what urban uh, level can do on that. They all have a link to a mobility uh, vision for their city. They all have a link to uh, how they think about food. They work with local knowledge institutions. All of these cities have a university and other knowledge institutions, and they work with local communities and networks that focus on sustainability. So I, I think the urban level indeed, and I'm glad it's part of the question, the urban level indeed is playing a critical role uh, in this, uh, this whole transition. And then not to forget that uh, I think increasingly we also see with economic actors the understanding that uh, those who will be in the lead in the next, uh, uh, in, in the future economy will be those who understand that uh, the boundary conditions for being successfully uh, successful economically in the 21st century are very different from those in the 20th century. Um, and so it's those who are willing to make those shifts that, that will be in the lead and that will get access to sustainable financial uh, instruments and that will be prioritized by policies that are driven in that direction. So. I know this is a long answer to uh, the question who who should be doing this. The short answer would have been everybody, um, but I think the the crux is to connect to connect the dots at 
all levels and in all sectors of society of those who are willing and able to overcome the barriers, the hurdles, the lock-ins, and to push through these and move things forward. That's where I think the, the, real, uh, the real energy and, and the real scope will be. Thank you for this answer. There's another question uh, that came in uh, stating to the transition. We, of, we for instance, want uh, in the mobility sector, but maybe the corona crisis will change things because, of course, public transport is often uh, seen as the answer, the alternative for cars. But yeah, people now maybe want to take again their individual cars again. So, and again, you have the same reasoning a bit for uh, plastic, uh, reuse, not reusable plastics. So how can this tension be solved? Well, I, I look, I, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how long uh, this corona uh, virus will be with us and at what level and what the impact will be on the necessary and often drastic measures that are taken and on human behavior that is changing in response to these measures. Huh? Uh, but I, I start from the assumption that uh, some of the behaviors that we see today and that are rational under the circumstances would be the long-term uh, behavioral trends for, uh, for, for years to come or the decade. So I think keeping an eye uh, on the needle on the compass, which means uh, these, these shifts also in the mobility system, sustainable shifts, that, that, that is where, where it's going. You could also make the argument that we are in the middle of the, the most massive involuntary experiment with, uh, with teleworking, uh, as we notice right now, uh, and that maybe some of that will remain and that that will have fewer people on the roads uh, rushing to Brussels uh, every day or rushing to wherever they need to be at work so we will have to see what stays and what what uh, shifts are temporary and how they will be phased out uh, over uh, over the next uh, months and maybe a couple of years with corona but i i i'm still a strong believer that uh, yeah, we we understand that that we will need to uh, come with fundamental uh, sustainable solutions for mobility and that is not getting everybody back into their individual car at the same moment, uh, rushing to the same spot uh, in the morning and in the evening. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is another question concerning uh, Poland. And uh, it is stated that in Poland, the special Corona law re releases from the obligation to carry out an environmental impact assessment because of the crisis. Do you think the precautionary principle could be weakened because of the corona crisis? I, first of all, I don't know that law in Poland, so I cannot comment on it. Uh, I think in general, the, the precautionary principle, as, as some people might, might know, is, the, is one of the four core principles embedded uh, in, in European uh, treaties. And so we, it, it is a core principle. I think it... Uh, it has been questioned numerous times from various uh, places, uh, claiming that it is against innovation and that it hampers uh, uh, investments in technologies and their breakthrough. Uh, that is not the case. In fact, the agency has done a large number of case studies on uncertainty and precaution in its late lessons from early warning series. It's quite the contrary. Uh, it can drive innovation into a sustainable uh, direction. Huh? Um, could it be under pressure in this period now, when uh, the focus is on, uh, on yeah, kickstarting the economy again on stimulus? Yes, I think it could be, um, and I think it will depend on whether we approach this period from what I call uh, a decontextualized uh, place, which means let's uh, subsidize, give tax cuts, uh, provide uh, uh, money to those who need it in the economy now and, and pretend that that is happening in a vacuum, or whether we look at um, 
this whole crisis and, and link it to uh, a broader picture, which is the European Green Deal, which is uh, yeah, the role of um, the public domain with public health, uh, with, you know, th there, are, there is a whole context of this crisis. And if we take that into account, I think precaution pops up as a, as a critical issue. Um, because uh, what we know from people who are specialized in uh, epidemics is that this is not falling from the sky. If you look at the World Economic Forum risk assessment, it has been in that risk assessment for several years. It has been uh, mentioned by the World Health Organization for several years. It has been in risk assessments uh, for many countries. Uh, so th this idea of precaution and dealing with risk and uncertainty, I think will probably become more important. And that is where I hope we will use the precautionary principle in a fundamental and intelligent way to innovate at a systemic societal level to mitigate the risk for this type of uh, impacts uh, in the future. So rather than stepping away from it, I think it's a wake up call to take it very seriously. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question. Uh, it's maybe a bit broader question. It relates to the way the European Commission can push member states, meaning the national governments, harder to start implementing air, water, and waste management. So, how can you be a commission push member states more? Well, I, I think it's it's in the portfolio of the commission indeed to, to do the compliance and eh? uh, in, in, in check that with countries and take measures. Yeah, And of course, uh, going to court over this infringement procedures, uh, when it needs to happen, it needs to happen. And I think uh, DG environment uh, is quite clear when it comes to that. But of course, you would prefer that that is not the outcome uh, because it means that there is a longer term of non-compliance and what you want is compliance. And I think uh, what, what has happened in uh, last years is that they've come with a new instrument, the, the environmental implementation review which is a screening at the country level, the member state level, of what issues there are with uh, environmental implementation, and then entering into a debate with the policymakers uh, to, you know, give clear signals, but also in a capacity building uh, scope where we've seen some twinning type exercises between countries that are uh, struggling with implementation and can learn lessons from those who are more advanced. And so that is, a, that is a new type of instrument in the box. Now, uh, it's quite obvious that if there is an, an, a clear unwillingness to invest in complying with key legislation on waste or on air quality, that the signal from the Commission is still that then infringement procedures are, uh, are the, the, the instrument that they can use. Um, I think in our in our reports we are always rather clear at which countries are reaching the targets and which ones are not, what the gaps are, and whether uh, they are living up to European uh, standards as agreed in legislation. Yeah. But the agency plays no role in the in the compliance per se. Okay, we had a question from Poland. Now we have a question from Athens, Greece. Uh, the question is, what is your opinion about the One Health, a more coordinated effort to combine health and ecological protection? Well, uh, I, I, I think it's obvious that there is a lot of scope to do this, because you could argue that uh, environmental policies are uh, preventative health policies. Uh, if you look at... Uh, air quality, but also water quality, noise pollution, uh, chemical pollution, they all have an impact on health, which means at a personal level, but also at the level of countries having to invest in healthcare systems. So it, it's clear that that, uh, that, that link is uh, there. Uh, integrating that in a policy uh, and in an approach is clearly a, a move forward. This is also increasingly the case when it comes to climate change. 
Uh, I mean, there is, a, there is an initiative that has been taken and that is in its early stages of setting up an observatory on the health impacts of climate change between the European Environment Agency and ECDC, uh, the European Agency in Stockholm that works on, uh, on uh, contagious diseases and, and the control of them. Uh, and that plays a big role now in the, the corona uh, crisis. And that is stimulated by the European Commission uh, in a very strong way. So yes, the, the short answer is yes, it makes a lot of sense to bring these areas back together. Healthcare and health is, is not uh, not only taking care when things have gone wrong, curative, uh, preventative healthcare is, is often a, a smarter choice as a society, and it's in the long run often much uh, less expensive as well, not only in, in financial costs, but also in, in a human well-being cost. Okay. Uh, we have two final questions, more going back to your agency. The first is, Will this corona crisis change the priorities of your organization? Well, uh, no, for the most part, because we, we are currently working on a 10 year strategy for the agency, which is very much in line with uh, the framing of 2030 policies objectives. And those are embedded in globally in the SDG agenda. And I think in, at the European level, clearly in the Green Deal, in the climate and energy uh, policies for 2030, and that's what we're focusing on. And they also involve uh, the whole breakthrough of uh, data intelligence and, and uh, you know, artificial intelligence and integrating satellite. Up the, that all is rather stable. Yeah? Uh, of course, uh, there might be increased attention for this link between health an environment, the link between the origins of the corona uh, virus and biodiversity laws, the, the link between climate change and environment, as I've mentioned, that might be the case. And the, the third impact, but uh, I, I start from the assumption that that will not be the case, is that if the European priorities would change dramatically, um, then, of course, that would have an impact on the work that the agency is doing, because we are, in essence, uh, bringing knowledge to European and national policies. But I start from the assumption that we've got our eyes on the medium and long term agenda uh, on sustainable development. And uh, so that, that's what, what we are focusing on and where we will invest and where we are working with the member states, with knowledge institutions in the countries but also with, uh, with the European Commission to frame the best possible knowledge for the most ambitious policy objectives. Okay, we come to the last question. Um, in other, other interviews, um, you mentioned the importance of an ecological public procurement policy. You always give the example of the restaurant of your organization. So what's so special about the restaurant of your organization? And how did you manage to get there? Okay, well, I would say, uh, did come and find out. Uh, we invite you. No, I, we, we have a canteen in the agency in Copenhagen. And almost invariably, when people visit us, they always comment very positively about our canteen. About how different is this canteen? Yeah? Because it, it has a really good selection of... Uh, yeah, vegetarian uh, dishes. Uh, it 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 has a uh, fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables there. I mean, it, it's it's all that. Yeah, and the basis of it is public procurement because we have to procure for canteen services, and we have a food policy that, in essence, fits on a page and even in one sentence. We want food that is good for ourselves and for the planet, and that is part of the criteria for our public uh, procurement. And what you notice when you put that into your criteria, uh, the market competes around those criteria. I've been there seven years now. We have had three different uh, providers for our canteen, and they all organize their, uh, their supply around these things, which means that we eat low in the food chain. We try to eat seasonal. We have uh, sort of limits on the amount of meat that can be served. Uh, there is fish, there is uh, 
always vegetarian options and on Thursday it's exclusively vegetarian. We don't eat a lot of sweets that is kept out of the, the diet. Uh, so we uh, local uh, providers. So it's about uh, low in the food chain, seasonal, low food miles, uh, links to uh, World Health Organization uh, sort of limits for intake of food. Lo very few processed foods. It's about it's about all of those things. And I'm not saying it's perfect. But yeah, you have a very different uh, canteen than you would have uh, in an average, I would say, public uh, ministry or, or in, a, in, in a European uh, institution. That is the case. And we, we enjoy it a lot and it serves us well and it stimulates others to think that this is possible. Okay, I think this is really great to end our talk with this very, uh, I would say, healthy uh, proposal and I think it's something can be it's something that can be implemented by all organizations all over Europe because you just have to follow the procurement rules of the European Union. So Hans, I really want to thank you for your time. I know you're very busy. It was a pleasure talking with you. And uh, the thing I really uh, take out of this is that we need systemic change we need the transition of the, our systems with the goal of 2050 and it also has to be a just transition. So before saying uh, goodbye, I want to end with two practical things. First is that uh, this was the first, but it will not be the last Green Post Corner Talk. On the contrary, already tomorrow we have our next session with two Great people, uh, Philip Lamberts, co-president of the Greens AFA group in the European Parliament, and also Mar Garcia, secretary general of the European Green Party. So please, uh, let's meet again tomorrow at four o'clock. And the other thing is, if you really like this kind of talks, it would be very helpful if you would be able to don donate a bit to the Green European Foundation. And you also find uh, a link in the chat about this so this also we would also be very grateful i wish you a very good day for the rest and hope see you again one of the coming green post corona talks thank you very much thanks a lot it was a pleasure